Firstly, I want to say thanks to Rob uh, and everyone here. It was a really warm welcome back this morning. As Rob said, I've come from Coventry today, so not a bad drive. Normally, I would be in St. George's Church in Coventry on a Sunday morning, but today I'm here with you guys, and I'm pleased that I'm able to share the story with you guys today. Gambling is a bit of a taboo subject. Gambling is not a swear word. Um, I've been through a horrendous journey. I'm going to take you guys through that journey today. Okay, so as it says here, Tony Kelly, founder and CEO of Red Car Gambling Sport Project. We will talk more about what I do today and how God has helped me to get to where I am today. And I think that's the most important thing and message I want to say today. So, first slide here. Now, as Robert said, back in the day, a long time ago, by the way. Yeah, I, I am, no, I'm not going to say I'm like that. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I am, um, yeah, nearly, yeah, nearly. Uh, in the 90s, I had 89 years as a professional footballer. Any Cardiff fans? Yeah. <laughs> At least there's one. Yeah. I think it was 1992, I went on a month's loan to Cardiff, in Park, I remember that, yeah. But I had uh, seven football clubs in a nine-year professional football career, from the second tier, in Stoke City, in the second division, right through to other clubs such as Cardiff Hall. Uh, Lane Orient, Colchester, and Berry, etc. This is one of the highlights. So, this is how life used to be. But along that nine year journey, I was one of the unfortunate ones that fell victim to gambling addiction. Now, gambling addiction today in the UK is absolutely huge. We now live in a culture of gambling in the UK. Uh, I'm passionate about educating young people, so when we get to the slides, what I'm doing today, that's probably my biggest passion in terms of educating young people on gambling related harm. Because I have cousins, I have nephews, etc or all get involved in gambling. And I think that's where we are today. You know, we are saturated with advertising, etc. So yeah, I, I like to share my story on, on different platforms to raise awareness. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I've come today is so that I can share my story with you guys, raise awareness, and hopefully, when you listen to my story, it might help you help others. I think that's the most important thing for me today. So why did I start gambling? Loads of different reasons why people start gambling. Um, I won't go into it today, it's not a workshop, but there's lots of different reasons. So I'll go back to the start of my journey, left school at 16, and I was fortunate enough to get a two year scholarship, and this was my first step on the ladder to professional football. So I went to Bristol City as an apprentice, that shows you how old I am, because they call them scholars now, yeah. <laughs> as an apprentice for two, for two years. Um, I was a little bit too wild, to be honest with you. I was a little bit too wild in terms of attitude, you know, I was going out with a nine club in 17, yeah. But so, I got released at 18, uh, crushed me, went back to Coventry, tail between my legs, see all the family, etc. and then I decided I wanted to move to London. So I moved to London at 18 years old, uh, having left Bristol City. And unfortunately, when I went to London, I signed for Dulwich Hamlet Football Club, which is a semi-professional football club, and across the road from Dulwich Hamlet Football Club was the dreaded footmakers. And that's where it all started for me. You know, I've come from country, I was very, very quiet, I was very, very shy, so I wanted to fit in as a group of senior, senior players at the club who were going across the road and putting on their football season bets on a Saturday afternoon at half one before the game, so my way of fitting in and having a sense of belonging with a group, you know, whether it's peer pressure, whatever you want to call it, but that's how I felt. That's how I, I wanted to fit in with, with a group. So I started playing the five pound, 10 pound coupons, and that's how I started at 18 years old. Lots of different other reasons why people start gambling in terms of advertising, in terms of um, trauma, you know, lots of different reasons. So that's why I started gambling. But along that journey, I got to 21, 
Uh, just before my 22nd birthday, I signed for Stoke City uh, in the second division. Uh, so all of a sudden, I've gone from being a postman in North London to being a professional footballer. My whole life has changed. My whole life has basically turned upside down. But obviously, you know, in, in a good way in terms of the financial side of it. But that's when I heavily, heavily got into gambling, big time. And when I say big time, you'll get to hear the end of the story, but basically, in a nine year period, I lost half a million pounds. I'm just gonna repeat that, half a million pounds in a nine year period, with lots of other issues that come with it. Uh, we're gonna to touch upon in a minute. So as you can see up here, in terms of repossessions, our two houses repossessed. I mean, when gambling addiction you grips you, it literally, and I mean literally, consumes you on a daily basis. And it also has an impact on all those that are around you in terms of your friends and family. So it's an evil addiction, it's a mental health disorder, it's a gambling disorder, and it's a public health issue. So that's why I'm so serious about talking about it, about raising awareness. Because a lot of people are being ruined and a lot of people are being hurt by gambling addiction. So other things there, anti-depression. Yeah, I got very depressed. Uh, I would have a bad day in the office, bad day in the bookies, or, or even terrible nights in the casino, because I got heavily involved with the casinos. And then I would have to go out and play in front of 20,000 people, having lost the week's wages. How do you do that? I don't know. But that's why I moved from club to club, seven clubs, because my form was sporadic, my mental health declined, couldn't sleep at night, bailiffs knocking on the door, hiding my car around the corner. I remember knowing that I hadn't made my car payments. And I, I, it's so clear, I hadn't made my car payments. So I know that my car's gonna be repossessed. So I used to park it about four streets down, down the road. <laughs> just, 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 just thinking, oh, I hope they don't find it. But you know, they got their tactics, they found it all right. <laughs> so all those kind of things we used to go through. In terms of, on a more serious level, in terms of family, I have a 25 year old daughter. See, I told you I was old. I have a 25 year old daughter, Savannah, and um, through one of the episodes of Gamma, I picked her up from school. She was nine years old, and it was midweek, and midweek football, all the coupons, so all the guys in here that know about midweek football, they know what I'm talking about, a million games. So we're walking past William Hill, and we said to Savannah, so just, just wait, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Now to this day, I don't know how long I went in that bookmakers for. This is 3.30 in the afternoon. I'm not gonna put one bet on, that's for sure. I'm gonna put five, six, seven, eight bets on. So I left my nine-year-old daughter outside of women and bookmakers. I don't know how long, could be 20 minutes. And they're the kind of things that gambling addiction brings you to. You know, neglecting people, neglecting your children. And we talk about it today, she remembers it like it was yesterday. Because obviously she's a nine-year-old girl thinking, what's happened to that? So these are the kind of things that you go through. Lost football years, as I said, my form was sporadic, in and out of the team, mental health, mission training, attitude, all the rest of it, because it does mess with your head. So I finished football at 30 years old, which is basically six, seven years too young. Uh, so on the scrap even basically got into what I call the real world. So yeah, that was the end of the football career. As I said, I had two houses to be possessed. I think one of the most important things here is the impact on family. So we have workshops that we deliver to schools and colleges anywhere around the country. Um, and we've got a three minute video with my sister who comes on and talks about how it impacted her and her family. Because when you're on that gambling addiction journey, those that are close to you, your loved ones will come on that journey with you. Because my sister bailed me out time and time again I've got five brothers. I've borrowed money off every single member of my family, my brothers. And I'm one of the fortunate ones, because I work with a lot of lived experience people, and I'm one of the fortunate ones in terms of my family has stuck with me. So I'm very, very lucky and very blessed. Because, you know, I've got friends that they don't even talk to their brothers. Some don't talk to their parents. Because that gambling addiction, that burden that you bring your family into, is just horrendous. So the impact on the family is really important. Lost friendships, eventually the phone's gonna stop ringing. Um, I used to borrow money off all my friends, pay back next month, pay back next week. Um, it never happens because you're a gambling addict and you exhaust all avenues of borrowing. That's what happens. And when I say all avenues of borrowing, I'm gonna touch upon my ultimately the bankruptcy that happened. So 
And as you can see here, I was a case study, well, it actually is next week, for GAMCare. GAMCare, one of the biggest treatment providers in the UK. So my case study is all about my bankruptcy. And as you can see here, I'm found in our red card number four by May Bank 2009 and discharged 2010. Now, that bankruptcy included 30 creditors. So that's pawnbrokers, that's loans, that's credit cards, you name it, I borrow money on every single avenue I could. And ended up with £192,000 bankruptcy file. When I first started out doing these delivery talks and workshops, I kept the file uh, as a memory, as a reminder of not going down that road again. So then it says mortgage, bank notes, credit cards, paid rent, etc. Didn't have to send the asset, already lost everything, as I said, the house and the cars, they all went. Never asked for any credit to about his gambling, and again, that's about social responsibility, which is which doesn't happen today for a lot of organisations. So I was never asked about gambling, just like your banks don't, or etc. etc. So responsible intervention can be a saving grace. It may be that it takes a third party to really open up someone's eyes in terms of where they are with their gambling, and then maybe they will address it and feel safe and comfortable to talk about it. And I think one of the things that I want from all my audience where I, where I go is to get people to talk about it. Yeah, and I know it's difficult, you know, it's not easy to talk about certain trauma adversity you've had in your life, but God has blessed me to be able to do this, to be able to share my story. If you would have asked me in 2009, 2010 that you were going to be going around the country sharing your story and educating people on gambling harms and writing books, etc., I would have thought you mad because. Yeah, that's what this is what God has done for me today. Now, 2009-10, the bankruptcy, I was just splitting up from my relationship for 20 years. So the partner, Sandra, eventually went, and that was obviously due to the trust issues, the lies, the deceit. It can only go on for so long. Now, something happened, what I call divine intervention, when God came into my life. Have to take a break. So I was working for Network Rail and I was in a signal box on my own, working alone, etc. And I had a lock on the door. And I've been there for around 10 years, since 2010, and I've uh, never had a visit like this in my life. And he said to me, I'm, I'm the network rail chaplain. So I said, well, I've been here 10 years, and I've never had a visit from the network rail chaplain. So I thought, what is this about? So that's for his ID, showed me his ID. Came in, brought a brand new Bible with him. And you've got to remember that I'd lost my way by now. So I didn't have strong faith. And he wrote me a prayer, prayer which, sorry it's a bit squiggly, but it says here, February 2009. So it goes, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you know me and love me. I believe that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of my sins. And that the blood which he shed Excuse me, cleanse my sins and repent of my sins. In the name of Jesus, I ask for forgiveness for my sins. I repent of my sins and pray that the blood of Jesus will cleanse my sins. Lord Jesus, please come into my life. And my Lord and Saviour, Holy Spirit, please come into my heart to dwell and live with me and be my constant companion, comforter, and guide. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And he's got in brackets. You've now become a Christian, you are born again. Your eternity is exalted and you will dwell in eternity with God forever. Never deny your faith. And at the bottom, he's got arranged to be baptised. So as I moved on after that, it wasn't a case that when I left that signal box, that my whole life changed. Because remember, I was going for a bankruptcy, the missus was leaving, 
because my life was a mess. Um, but what it gave me, it gave me hope. That's what it gave me when I left there. I started to read the Bible more, started to read more scriptures, started to get closer to God and build that relationship until the real moment came three years later in 2013. I won't talk about that. That's three severity of gambling harms, which is up incarceration, obviously gambling related suicide and homelessness. So we know how bad it can get. Uh, I bet many people have been down this road and unfortunately we have 650 gambling related suicides in the UK every year. And that's gonna go on. So the start of recovery I was just mentioning. So 2013, my sister said to me, she's a head teacher, and she said to me, there's a few snippets coming out in the press about professional footballers gambling. And she said, why don't you write a book? And I looked at her and I thought, what? <laughs> and she said, yeah, write a book, put your story to print. Didn't have a clue about how to write a book, obviously. So she said, just write a chapter from nine years old, growing up in Coventry, going to Bristol City, start your football journey, going through the gambling addiction, etc. So I wrote, I think I wrote one chapter, it might have been half, gave it to her, and then she said, yeah, you can do this. She's very religious as well as a Christian. She said, you can do this. And I spent the next 18 months with my trusted biro, no ghostwriting, none of that nonsense, <laughs> my trusted biro and A4 paper. And I wrote for 18 months and I couldn't stop writing. And so 2013-14, Red Card was born. And with that, got published on Amazon, etc. Uh, I had an invite, as Rob said earlier, I had an invite to go into BBC Breakfast. Now you can find that on YouTube. So the big thing about that for me, when I left that red sofa, is all the contacts that I had after that in terms of phone calls and emails. Because that's when I realised I'm not alone. That's when I realised how big gambling addiction is. And so there's a question of what next? So obviously I talked to my sister and family and I decided to set up Red Card Gambling Support Project, which is an organisation dedicated to promotion, promoting gambling awareness and education for everybody. So this is me, probably one of the first workshops at the school. So this is what we do around the country. We do lots of other things in terms of referrals, etc. But the main purpose of our work is to raise awareness and to educate people about what gambling actually looks like, what it feels like, how we can support them, and just really get to the bottom of the roots of gambling addiction. So I go around schools and colleges and other organisations and agencies. There I am again in another school. So fast forward to 2021, I had an opportunity to write my second book. Now my second book is Red Card of You Can Win. So somebody's going to win this today. <laughs> somebody's going to win today. So the first book ended, but without the birth of Red Car, without the birth of books, without the birth of you know, what I'm doing today. So everybody said, well, what happened at the end of the recovery? What happened for the next seven or eight years? And that's what this book is about. I bet you can win. Red Car, I bet you can win. Because in my mind, with God's help, and God's support, and God's guidance, he has managed for me to be able to win this particular bet of Beat My Demons. It's a story of, I suppose, triumph, inspiration, but more, more importantly, hope, and how God can touch people and how he's touched my life. And sometimes, you know, I speak to family members and I say to them, I don't know how I went from being rude to being a CEO, to being a published author, to being a public speaker. I have no idea, but I do now. I know it's been done through God and through me. So, Red Card Event You Can Win is also out on Amazon. These are services that we do. As I said, training, and we're going to be telling our conversation referrals. We do a lot of work. I've worked with the Gambling Commissioner Regulator, trying to make gambling safer for all. Um, we are, as I said earlier, in terms of an epidemic, in terms of the culture of gambling in the UK. We, we need to try and make gambling safer. So I work with the commission on that, and obviously we do a lot, a lot of work to various different organisations agents and agencies across the country. 
continue to sustain recovery of hope, and I think that's the biggest thing for me, hope. And when I left that signal box that day, that's what I felt. Um, I speak to God every single day. My church is every Sunday like today uh, in Coventry. And I've built that relationship with God. And I think that's what it is for me in terms of having a relationship with God. You know, knowing what he's doing for you, praising him, thanking him for what he's doing for you. And that's how I feel today. I feel truly, truly blessed about how he has touched my, touched my life and guided me uh, for, the next, for the last 10 years. So, as I said, the books are all, all available. We are at CIC. We have done we like donations and, uh, excuse me, donations and funding as a CIC company. Uh, but we'll continue, you know, to, to build as an organisation. We'll continue to educate. I will continue to share my story across different platforms. I think that's one of the most important things for me in terms of getting out there into communities and raising awareness and, and trying to help as many people as I can. Because there will be people. There might be one or two in this room that know people struggling with gambling. Um, and I'm just saying to you that whoever, whoever it is, you know, you have to get support as quickly as possible before it spirals out of control. And that is easier said than done because it's an addiction. Uh, but when you listen to my story on testimony, that you can come out the other side. And you definitely come out the other side if you have got in your life. Got in your life. That's for sure. Okay, guys. So, here's quiz time. The first, it's going to go to the first, first hand on. Yeah? Or the first answer, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Easy, Rob. Okay. So, the bankruptcy was how much? 119,000. Yeah! Come on, come on. That's the one with this bit. There you go, we're going to sign it afterwards. We'll sit down and sign it afterwards for you. What's your name? My name's Petra. Petra, yeah. God bless you, Petra. Yeah. <laughs> Just want to finish off by saying thank you to Robert uh, and, and his wife. I'm a girl, Great to be Rob and, uh, and obviously the team here. Uh, Mr. Techman, everybody here, those making the tea and coffee, really, really warm welcome today. Really, really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully I'll come back at some point as we grow, and as my journey grows. Uh, but I just want to finish off by saying that I can't, I can't even put into real words how much the Lord has helped me in my life and will continue to help me in my life. So I just want to say thank you, Lord, praise the Lord, and let's have an amen from everybody. Amen. amen. God bless, thank you. So let me just share just quickly with people. Gambling, for, for some people, you're listening. What's the attraction to that? Mm. Why, why, why get some people, you know, alcohol, drugs, other things. But, but why, why, why gambling? And that's my, yeah. you know, that's my yeah. too big of a question to... Yeah. Obviously, people gamble for different reasons, but you know, ninety percent of people gamble for financial reward. It's just, it's as simple. We live in uh, a cost of living crisis. There's areas of deprivation all over the place. There's areas of poverty all over the place. I, when I was working in London, I think it was sixty-seven percent of the bookmakers were situated in areas of deprivation, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, people want to get out of poverty. People want to enhance their lives. When you've got this bombardment advertised on your TV screens and social media and press and airway and TV, it's inevitable some people are saying, well, oh, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna try this. Once you have your first win, then you become delusional. This is easy money, it's gonna happen every week and we know that doesn't happen. So, lots of different reasons, obviously, as I said earlier about in terms of trauma and childhood trauma, uh, it could be going through anything in your life. Some people may turn to drugs, some people may turn to alcohol, some people turn to cancer. What were your sort of first um, thoughts when this guy, this chaplain from Netgrave Rail, came up to you? We mm. just led you to Jesus. Yeah. But just share a little bit more about that moment. I know it's difficult. Yeah. But, you know, that guy it took a lot of guts for him to do that. Yeah. Um, but, but, but maybe just share a little bit more about that moment with us because yeah. that was powerful and that's changed you. I think when we sat down, we sat down for two hours. 
Um, and I was going through the bankruptcy, and I was going through um, the breakup of my 20 year relationship. Um, and, and what we talked about was not, not just about you know, the gambling, but we talked about the future. And we talked about hope, we talked about how regaining, that, regaining my faith and relationship with the Lord is where I should be heading. So he all he was doing encouraged me, encouraged me, encouraged me. And as I said to him, when he when we left, when he left, I just I just felt different. I felt different. I felt like there is hope out there. I felt like and I started obviously for the next few weeks and months I got closer to God. And obviously as I said, you know, three years later, you know, things started to doors started to open and things started to happen. And I think the one thing that I'll take out of that journey, you know, that I did forget to mention on June the 7th, 2017, which is my Bible from my church in um, Enfield, North London. As you can see, Rob, June the 27th, 2017 is when I was baptized. When I got baptised, that brought me closer to God, and that's where I really felt the, the power of the Lord, basically. And one of the things with the work is that, you know, those of you that might have a, a charity or, or a CRC, when you rely on funding, when you rely on support, and you're trying to get across the line, and you're trying to, you know, develop, sometimes we get knockbacks, we get rejections, and that's and one thing we learn about the Lord, is about patience and believing in His time. His time and then it happened. Yeah. And one last thing. People here today, you know, they, they might have issues in their life, you know, gambling or people that they know, but maybe they're just struggling with something. Maybe other things that other addiction, but what what would maybe be the one thing that you would tell them that they can do that would help them bring them out of that yeah. into life? What would be your one piece of advice, maybe just to move them on from where they are? Um, if you could speak to Tony Kelly back in 2010, because mm -hmm. when you know he's going through, what one piece of advice to you or, or to them, what would it be today? Well, firstly, I think you've got to... Stop doing my... Stop doing that. Like, see, yeah, obvious, yeah. But it's also very easy, isn't it? Yeah, say. and not everyone's obviously got, got a you know, religion or whatever or, or a belief, but if you are a Christian, you have, you have to believe. You, you really do have to believe, but it's got to come from the heart, and God will put it in your heart. So believe firstly, and I think that anybody can come out of any kind of trauma, uh, any adversity they've got in their life. There's thousands and millions of people that have been through stuff uh, that have come out the other side. And I think my advice from where I know I was, in terms of living in a shared house with four people, 192,000 bankruptcy files, relationship gone, basically, you know, rock bottom, you know, to where I am today. It just shows that. And I don't, I haven't got, you know, degrees and A-levels. So that's irrelevant. You know, from the heart, you know, from the heart and mind with belief, and belief from the Lord, anything is possible. And I'm testing to that. Good. Excellent. Oh,